Welcome to In the Lab. My name is Nick, and this is take two, unfortunately, but it's all good. So welcome to In the Lab. I'm here with my friend, Brad Hill. Super excited to have him on today here at Story. Brad, you got some awesome stories, man, and I've been fortunate to get to know you over the last couple months. And so for those who don't really know you, and I'm still really getting to know you some too, man, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get here today? And not just the vehicle you drove. <laughs> Well, thanks, Nick. You know, I, 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 it's an honor to be here and that you would ask me to share my story. I do want to put a prerequisite in that uh, I, uh, a lot of my past is cloudy at times, um, and uh, I don't know if that's due to age or uh, all the drugs and alcohol I did, so please forgive me. But, uh, you know, I, I'm excited, and I'm excited to be your friend but not only your friend, your co-labor, and uh, you know, having a crossroads as our sister church is a blessing. So, right. yeah, I, I'm I pastor Winchester Bible here in Winchester. You know that we just started a little while ago, and uh, God's blessing it. Um, and uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But anyway, uh, oh, I'll go way back um, I mean, at the age of zero. <laughs> at, the, at the age of zero, I was born in in Salt Lake City, Utah. In 1960, um, I only year my mom was born. Really? Yep. Gosh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Making man. me old, man. You, no, you're not old, man. You're 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 still young. You're kicking. <laughs> so anyway, uh, 1960, uh, we spent a year in Utah. Then my dad got uh, moved over to uh, New Jersey. He was a pharmaceutical uh, executive, and uh, so anyway, we were raised in a little town called Mountain Lake, New Jersey. Um, and today that that area is one of the most sought after uh, for folks in the city um, it's it's it, it, well anyway um, you know and, and I had a great childhood uh, dad was gone a lot you know and uh, that that uh, I still had daddy issues because he was never around but my mom did the best she could we wanted for nothing yeah I mean we were Ray he was very very uh, he, he, he provided well and uh, so we we, uh, me and my brothers and sisters, uh, were raised in a good, loving home. I was raised as a Mormon, yep. and uh, that's important for my story uh, because I was really very involved in that yeah. growing up. But anyway, uh, went to school, did well, had a lot of friends. Uh, I wasn't really a, uh, a student, uh, but I was an athlete. I loved athletics. My dad, uh, you know, told us early on, you know, you're going to do sports. That's not an option. Um, so he said, pick one. So I tried them all. I tried track, basketball, baseball. I did well in all of them, but um, uh, football was my forte. Um, I, I just loved it. I loved hitting people. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, loved, uh, I loved the strategy of football, uh, and I loved our coach. He was one of the best. He still, well, he's passed away now, but he was one of the best coaches uh, in New Jersey history. But um, so anyway, I was I I, I was raised, uh, you know, both going to church and uh, and attending school. Now, uh, Mormons, uh, as as you might well know, uh, have to go to serum, uh, I'm sorry, se seminary, and uh, that that's uh, uh, that's something that you do before school. It's so like an everyday thing. Correct. So uh, at the beginning of the age of thirteen, I think I was required to go to church uh, early, early in the morning. And again, there weren't many Mormon churches back then. So our church was 30, 45 minutes. We did this every day. Wow. We attended classes there, and then uh, we, we rushed home and, and, uh, and attended our high school classes or school classes. So anyway, I did that. I was real involved. Um, you know, I had a lot of friends in the church. I had more friends in the church in different high schools than my own high school. So, you know, I spent a lot of time there. I had a girlfriend that, uh, you know, I had a crush on, too. Uh, so I think that kept me there. But anyway, um, anyway, um, after that, after I graduated from high school, I went to the University of Utah, go Utes, and uh, just uh, blended in uh, the first uh, few semesters. Uh, my dad was a you know uh, avid you know sports fan, but he was also he also required us all all of us boys to um, to join his fraternity, which was Sigma Chi. And uh, so we did that, and I did that, and, um, you know, that's where my life changed forever. Um, I was, uh, I was uh, abstinent of any alcohol and drugs during high school. Um, never really, you know, maybe drank a beer or something, but didn't really care. 
Um, but when I got to college and I joined this fraternity, um, my whole life changed. I, I'll never forget one night, um, it, it was during a MASH party, you know, where you uh, MASH, the, yeah. the, the, the TV show, uh, we all were, and you know, I dressed up as, as Colonel Klinger. <laughs> we tried pulling this just a little closer. Oh, just sorry, guys. Um, and um, so anyway, um, that's the night uh, my big brother, we all had big brothers in the fraternity, and he asked me to come up and um, he opened up his drawer, pulled out some powder, mm -hmm. a razor blade, a dollar bill, and asked me if I knew what, I, what, what he was doing. I said, I have absolutely no idea. I was scared to death. Um, but uh, he rolled up that do uh, dollar bill, and uh, I did my first line, and then it was off to the races. That's uh, in the early 80s where cocaine was like really young. Correct. In the, in the States. Correct. Yeah. Uh, cocaine was the thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, um, you could put a pound of pot in front of me, I wouldn't care. You could put a bunch of alcohol. But man, you put uh, opiates, cocaine, uh, you know, uh, benzos in front. I'll eat. I'll do them all. But anyway, um, did that line, and um, man, I I'll never forget the euphoric feeling. Um, it was just euphoria. Yeah. And man, I became I became like indispensable. I mean, I was like indestructible. Absolutely. I mean, and so I never forget. I went downstairs and I found a girl that I had a crush on that I'd never talked to. And we had a full on conversation. I think I asked her out and I think she said yes. So, uh, but I needed more <laughs> because cocaine runs out real quick. <laughs> so I went back upstairs and this time it wasn't uh, for free. He charged me and I, it was, it was an eight ball. I, I'll never forget. I took the eight ball to my room. I had a room in the fraternity and I uh, proceeded to do it all. I think in the next day or two, um, never slept, but, uh, Anyway, that was that was the beginning of the end. I, I did get through college. I, I graduated, um, and uh, I went to school with a, a bunch of, of, of influential kids. Um, one was Jay Willard Marriott the um, Third. He his daddy's you know the Marriott Hotel guy, and uh, they got me a job. He got me a job um, working at the LAX Marriott in uh, LA downtown down yes yeah, sir and uh wow it's uh you know that hotel is in between all the sports venues or used to be uh, where the forum was down the street and uh, the coliseum was a, a few miles away um but uh i got a job as a restaurant assistant restaurant manager and uh moved up quick um became the the, the uh food and beverage director and uh, like like i said those sports venues were real close and that attracted uh, groupies because all the athletic teams stay there. Pro um, and college? Well, mostly just pro. Okay. Because um, L.A. still had the Raiders at this point. Correct. They, had, they, they mm -hmm. didn't move back to Oakland. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. And got... they had the Rams, too, at that point. Correct. Oh, wow. That was a booming time. Correct. And you had the L.A. Lakers down there. Yeah, the man. And so Magic it, Johnson was yeah. playing for them. So yeah. they were... Well, just so you know, Magic Johnson and uh -huh. Larry Bird, I'm going back here, excuse me, but they played at the at the Salt Palace in Oh wow. In Utah. Yeah. For that the national championship. Correct. That was a that was like an epic game. We stood outside we couldn't get in. I'm but sure we stood not. outside the, wow. before, you know, they had screens and we just stood outside. Yeah. But it, you know, again, uh, how do we get on that? Anyway. I love sports, too, so you're going to make some references. And, oh, okay. And I'm going to look for, like, Pat Riley might have been the coach of the Lakers at that time. I don't remember. Because he was either there. I think he was there. Then he went to the Knicks. And then he went to Miami. So I think he might have been you the coach. Are, the you're pretty good. I don't know. I don't know. I just remember that, that day uh, that they played. Uh, but anyway, I went to school in Marriott. He got me a job. Assistant restaurant manager. Moved up quick. All the athletic venues were were around the hotel they all stayed there so uh i was kind of like i was like the most popular man in that hotel i mean this at this point i started selling drugs um and uh man i'll tell you what uh it it was a real 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 uh, fun time mm -hmm. but uh, until uh, uh, until <laughs> i got until i got fired i got found out and again i'm at that point, I got, didn't get charged for anything, thank God. But anyway, and then uh, from there, I um, <laughs> I found myself on the street. Mm. Um, I had uh, I had a habit. It was out of control. Um, 
I uh, I remember living out of my car um, until that broke down, and then uh, I remember oh gosh going to uh, the rescue mission a lot up there. And um, anyway, I did that for a while, and this is where things get dark or cloudy for me because I don't necessarily remember a lot. But I remember one day this guy came up. I'm a little bit this guy came up to me um, that I kind of knew on the street. Uh, he always passed by, whatever. And he asked me to go to church with him. Okay. And uh, he said, it was a did, stranger or was it a friend? It, it was an acquaintance. Okay. Somebody that walked the street but was not a street person. I gotcha. Anyway, they, it, he asked me to go um, to church with him. And uh, he said he'd drive me there and uh, he would buy me lunch. So I said, okay. Um, so it was a Sunday morning, um, went to, um, actually drove to Costa Mesa, California, okay. which is a little bit away from LA. It took us a while to get there, um, but he said it was worth it. And that's where, um, that's where I heard the Lord for the first time. Oh, wow. Um, I'll never forget that message. I, and I know, you know what I'm talking about. One of those messages that you're like, did who the heck talk to you? <laughs> yeah, they just read your mail. They knew exactly what to say. I, no, I'm not joking, man. Yeah. This was right on, man. And uh, I raised my hand. I forget it. Uh, I ran to that altar. I'll never forget it. And uh, actually, at that, uh, Chuck Smith was actually the pastor there um, at Calvary Chapel, and um, he he led me to the Lord. So um, that day again, my life changed. Wow. Um, I had no desire for drugs or alcohol, um, and I I wanted to be more. I wanted to be more. Mm. You know, I got I had a taste of it. Yeah, I had that experience, but I wanted more. Yeah, man. So um, uh, I, uh, my friend who happened to be part of that church, um, got me a little little tiny um, apartment. Uh, in Costa Mesa, and I would spend my days uh, driving the super, super shuttle to and from the airport, uh, driving and delivering people, and then the other time I would be at the church all yeah. the time. And this is in the 80s still? Correct. We, we're talking mid-80s. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, but we're closer to the 90s. But anyway, um, I drove the super shuttle, and then I would just go to the church, and I'd yeah. Volunteer. And what do you want me to do? So I painted walls. I cleaned bathrooms. I just, and I was happy to be there. I felt yeah. safe there. Praise God. You know, I, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget how gracious people were. And, um, you know, I was an oddity then because I really, I mean, seriously, I think I was more obnoxious, <laughs> you know, wanting to help, you know. Yeah. And when I was done with the project, I, you know. All right, what's next? Yeah, and it was a huge, you know, mega church. So, yeah. um, anyway, one day he came to me. Uh, never, you know, about I'd say six, eight months in, he came to me and asked me if I, if I wanted to go to Bible college. And uh, I thought about it for a second, and I said yes. So um, he, um, he, uh, he is in Chuck Smith. Yes, he moved me to um, Temecula. California, where they have the Bible College at the Marietta Hot Springs. Okay. And uh, that's where it is still today. Is that a Calvary Church Bible College? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And this is where Calvary Chapel started to really blow up. Yeah, man. I mean, you're getting Calvary's everyone. It just happened yeah. to be one in Marietta and the Hot Springs. Um, it, th that used to be a resort and actually a resort of the gangsters. Oh. Uh, but well, they bought it and made it a Bible College. And that's where I went to school. Awesome. And so um, I completed Bible college, went back, and uh, he he offered me a job as an assistant pastor. At uh, the Costa Mesa location? Correct. Correct. Um, and so I did that. I did I did whatever you know I was asked to do. It yeah. wasn't much. Yeah, but um but I, I you know it was a I didn't pay much. I still had to drive that shuttle. Mm -hmm. But um anyway, so then um his son in law had a church in uh, Vista, California, which isn't too far away, but it's more towards San Diego. And uh, he asked me if I would go there and help him. So I did. I moved to Vista and started out as a 
the assistant pastor of the children's ministry. And uh, I got to tell you, Nick, I hated that job. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I man. can't. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I hated that job. I bet. Man. No, I hated no, that I job. I can understand, man. Trust me. I oh, was, my gosh. You and I are cut from the same cloth on that. I might do youth ministry now with teens and young adults, but I can't do younger kids. Well, you no know, way. and it, I went, I never I kept going to, you know, uh, his son-in-law, Brian, who's actually running the whole thing now, um, I said, I can't do this. Uh, he said, yeah, you're going to do it. Um, <laughs> so it, it was important. The way that Calvary Chapels train assistant pastors is they put you everywhere. Yeah. To, pre- to prepare you. Yeah. So I did it for two years, uh, begrudgingly. Finally, finally. <laughs> He came up to me and asked me if I wanted to do young adult and a college and career. So I did that for a while. And then um, then he asked me if I wanted to do uh, missions. And that was my gig. Oh, wow. My gosh, I got to take groups. Overseas? Oh, yeah. I've been everywhere. Oh, man. I've been blessed. Um, How many countries have you, did you get to go to? Oh, gosh, Nick. I don't know um, if I were to count. More than 15? Oh, yeah. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. Just the Africa trip. Oh, wow. 15. Um, I'd say about uh, 30. That's cool. You know, been to Russia, been to Israel, all of Africa, West Africa, actually. Um, so, and South America. I haven't been to China. I wanted to go there. But anyway, um, that was my gig. I really enjoyed that. And I'm a people guy. You, you know? lit up when you said that. Oh, I love it. You're, you're smart. You just like lit up smiling. Yeah. Man. I, I thought my calling was to be a missionary, uh, but I found out it's not. But that, you know, just taking groups in. Yeah. Uh, and uh, getting to know the people in foreign lands. We did this little skit called King of Hearts. And Nick, I, we, I want so bad to do this. <laughs> and, and it's so incredible. What I is mean, it? It's, it's a play okay. that you do with no talking and you take it anywhere you go. It speaks to everybody. Okay. I'll never forget in Russia. We were in, uh, uh, I think, Kiev, and uh, we did that, and uh, people got, I mean, people got saved. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so I did that for a while, and then one day, so it was one day, um, he asked me if I would be willing to move to Virginia. Um, so this is what happened um, over those years, is that... Um, the Navy SEALs, um, they're, they're stationed at Bud's. Yeah, and that's in Southern California. Correct. And you're San Diego. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, close to our church. Yeah. And they would get saved and go to our church. And then um, mm-hmm. Camp Pendleton's there as well. Um, and they kind of support the, the SEALs. So what would happen is they uh, they finish Bud's or whatever, and then they'd be transferred uh, back to Norfolk. Yep, um, still Team Six there, and uh, other support groups are in Norfolk. So he asked me if I'd be willing to go to um, to Norfolk, to Virginia Beach, to pastor a small church and military yeah. people, specifically the Navy SEALs and the uh, and the um, Army. I don't yeah, know. military families. Correct. And yeah, and uh, so yeah, um, took a trip back just to see what it was like. You know, I knew most of the people anyway, and so we started a little church in a home okay. of one of the SEALs. Um, the thing about Navy SEALs is they're here today, gone tomorrow. Yes. And so Drop I would hat, they're gone. Correct. And so my ministry was mostly to the families yeah. who were left behind. It did really, really well. In fact, um, we, we, grew, we grew crazy. Uh, we went from a house to a storefront, from a storefront to a a warehouse from a warehouse to a bigger warehouse and then then finally to the biggest that we had um and i i was still clean still sober still focused this whole time Mm -hmm. you haven't had any issues with cocaine Mm -hmm. or anything else since that college experience Mm -hmm. and when you're down and out in la eight days nope clean as a whistle and um yeah we grew quick yeah um, so anyway, um, and this is early 2000s. Okay, so I got let's see. No, no, no. This is 1996. Okay, look, your memory's a little bit better. I got that. <laughs> your memory's pretty. 1996 good. is when I went back. Okay, um, is when you came to Virginia. 
Correct. Okay. I hope this is making sense. It is. It's totally making Very sense. Very cloudy. I, yeah, but I like timelines. I'm good with that. I know. That's why I keep like bringing no, please, it back into Please, please help me. I might remember something. No. I'm remembering little things as we talk. You're remembering a lot, man. Yeah, but anyway... Um, one night, okay, it's very successful, very successful. Um, one night, I, I'll never forget, it was Wednesday night, I did my midweek study. We had a good, we had about six, 700 people at the study. Wow. Um, and I was doing Psalm 51, which of course is David's yeah. plea for repentance, yep. forgiveness. Yep. After that, she passed. After Bathsheba, and I was I was teaching on Psalm 51, and I'll never forget it. Um, are you familiar with Virginia Beach at all? I mean, I'm I'm not. I've never been to Virginia Beach, but I'm familiar with like the military aspect. Yeah. So so we had our church was off of 264, which is close, which is more in Virginia Beach, um, by a place called Mount Trashmore. Okay. Uh, Mount Trashmore is a, a trash heap that they just covered. Okay. And it's the tallest. Place place in, in Virginia Beach. So anyway, um, I was driving home, 264. My house was actually at the beach. So um, uh, if anybody's familiar with Virginia Beach, you know that you come off the freeway and you go into Surface Street. There's no exit. You just The freeway turns into um, a Surface Street. And yeah. um, every night I, I drove home, I, I, could, I could always tell. I could, it's just part of being a drug addict. I could tell who had something okay this night for who knows what reason i i don't remember um it, everything was good everything was great had you thought about drugs much no i mean it, i mean i think about it still now i mean not then not that i like desire like like have the desire to like fulfill it and go do it but yeah sometimes i'm just like you know ecstasy and crystal meth and you know the whole rave scene drugs were really my more you know game than you know uh, than like downers and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and so like every once in a while, like the feeling hits me. But now you know, it does, but not back then. Okay. Um, it really it was amazing. Right on. So driving home, saw someone I knew who was carrying. I uh, pulled off and asked him uh, if he had any cocaine. Why I have no Just idea. Just like out of the blue. Yes. Everything is going good. Very yeah. successful. Very yeah. successful. I mean, and pastor's dream. Yeah. Um, really, if you grew from a house church to 700 on a midweek Bible study, was well, I mean, total if you had everybody come to our church about 1500. That's a lot, man. Yeah. So, yeah, everything was going great, yeah, man. By, yeah, by like normal standards, we but would this judge is you my and say story. You're doing great. Well, wait a minute. This yeah. is my story. I think I have a a sabotage. Yeah, a lot of us have that. Everything's too good. Yeah. Addicts don't. Sometimes they, they can't handle that. Yes. You need something tragic. So did they have it? Uh, no. They had crack. Oh, yeah, which is worse. Never heard of crack. Okay. Heard of crack, but yeah. crack is whack. Yeah, That's yeah. all I heard. So uh, anyway, I was like, well, what do you do with this? And he showed me how. He gave me a, a little tube. and A little taster. A little, uh, some uh, chore boy to put in there. Um, and I did, man, it's cocaine on steroids. Yes, I'm very familiar. Um, had a bell ringer. I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but man, that was it. Um, I bought a whole bunch of it. I, I, I remember going to the ATM, and the ATM back in those days would only give you so much money. Um, but I got enough to get a lot of it, and I spent the night um, in He's my going, car. You're going ham on it. Crazy. And uh, I, I finally stopped. I didn't, I, again, nothing happened. Nothing transpired. Nobody knew. Um, Were you single at the time? Yes. I never went home. Still. Um, never was there. So I got over that. And then... Um, did you get over that by yourself? Did yeah, you... it was only a few days. Okay, I but went... I mean, but you, did you... Okay, never mind. Keep going. Yeah, so I, I stopped. And then I recognized that I could not do that. Yeah, it would not. It would not. No way, because I would. I would lose everything. So, um, I. But it got me going again, mm -hmm. and I. And I thought, well, I can't drink because I don't like it. Yeah, and people smell it. Yes, right. Yep. 
Um, so what I'll do is, you know what, I have some doctors in, in our fellowship. I'll just uh, go to them and see if I can get something. Yeah. Um, like an opioid, or because I've had experience with Vicodin up to this point, my teeth, whatever. Yeah. Uh, always like that feeling. So I started a doctor shop in my own church mm. and uh, went from one to the other. Um, and just, again, went to town. Then uh, I went from the medical doctors to the psycho doctors and uh, did benzos. They would give me tons of Xanax, benzos. Um, and I'm, I'm still pastoring the church. Yeah, wow. Um, and so um, eventually all this ran out. Yeah. You know, politely, I never. It, they never said, you know, Brad, you're a drug addict. But they said, you know what, we, we need to stop. Yeah. And so it was, it was a good, there was no real, you know, major blow up or anything. But anyway, I'll never forget it. One night again, it's Wednesday night. I don't remember what I was talking, teaching. I took too much. Mm. Damn it. I think I took 10 two milligram bars. And for people who don't know, that's a lot. You take a half of one and you're out. Mm. So I think I took 10. No, oh, wow. And I, I got up and taught. And and I got to be honest, I thought I was teaching like crazy good. You were teaching at church like this? Dog. Every Bible study. Wow. <laughs> I'm glad that you can. I'm not laughing at the story because you're being extremely vulnerable. And I really No, you're fine. That, but that's kind of like there's some bit of a comical. Because like in the moment, you, you're you probably going to say, I thought I was doing great. Oh, I thought, man, I'm Oracle of God. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, I was like, this is good stuff. <laughs> right? And yeah. I'm not really looking at my notes, yeah. which I usually do. Yeah. And I'm like, man, the spirit is, I don't know how it works. <laughs> is this what the Indians talk about when yeah. they, they hook? And uh, I'll never forget it. So I got, I, I got off the stage. And people are, I mean, during the whole message, they were looking at me really intently. I'm like, man, I'm reaching them. <laughs> I really am. So anyway, um, my sound guy comes up to me. Mm -hmm. And he had a little office like this. And he said, I, I need you to hear something. And so he proceeded to take, back then it was tapes. Um, and he played me the tape. And I sounded mm -hmm. drunk. Oh. Slurring words. Uh, very obvious that I was, that something was wrong. Yeah. And uh, he said to me, uh, I don't think anybody else approached me. At that point, he said, you need some help. You need to get off this, whatever it is. So anyway, um, the doctors ended up stopping. So I started writing my own prescriptions. This is when computers were just starting. Um, I would get a prescription pad, or no, I'm sorry, a prescription. And then I duplicate it in my computer. Back then, there was no security yeah, paper yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. Um, copied the DA number, which right there, I just mimicked the prescription completely. And then I went online and, and learned how to be a pharmacist and wrote my own. Wow. Uh, still pastoring. Uh, eventually, long story short, um, it all come crumbling down. Yeah, one night. Um, uh, one of the pharmacy tech people figured it out, mm -hmm. called the cops. I was arrested that night. Again, pastoring a church. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, you know, spent the night in the hole and I was let out on my own recognizance because I'd yeah. never been in trouble. I went from uh, where I was to another pharmacy that very same day and caught, caught again. Mm -hmm. Same thing. These are felonies. Yes. So um, this time they didn't let me out. I had no bond. So at this point, I guess the church figured it out. Yeah. But here's the deal. It got worse because I'll never forget. I was in, uh, after the second charge, I was in the holding tank and uh, a drunk came up to me and, uh, you know, I was, I was, I, I forget what I was doing. And he said, uh, hey, wake up or whatever. I might have been asleep. He said, you need to see what's on TV. And so I turned around, and my face was on, on the news. Mm. And a uh, local pastor, Falls, I forget what the guy was. It was just another dark time, and that's when yeah. I was fired. Okay. From the church that I started, yeah. uh, they came and visited me in jail and fired me. Yeah. 
I was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Um, I served uh, one of them. All the rest were suspended. Um, so I was in prison yeah, man. as a pastor. So, I, so was it during that time when you were in prison that you started in the recovery community? Mm -hmm. or, or did that come after that? Came after that. Okay. So um, I was released after um, my time. Uh, went back on the street, still did it, still did drugs, still was just street guy. Yeah, you're going to hurt kid doing drugs, man. Correct. And then uh, I got a call from a friend in Richmond who knew me, and he asked me, he owned, he uh, runs a uh, ministry out there for drugs, uh, Good Samaritan Ministry. Okay. And he asked me if I wanted to come out and get help, so I did. Got to Richmond somehow, I don't even remember. Um, was there. Got clean, um, worked on staff for a while as a chaplain. He knew my past. Yeah. And uh, so I did chaplain work and stuff, but it didn't stop still. I started writing scripts again. Um, didn't get caught, but um, it was bad. Yeah, you kind of learn your mistakes and what to do better. Correct. Unfortunately. Correct. Yeah. So then one day, uh, this is when uh, we, we went through a lot of years here. I'm just trying to give you the. the yeah, no, no, that's, that's good conversation. Okay. Um, so I'm winding down. Um, <laughs> so I uh, uh, I had a friend I, again. I was let go from Good Samaritan. They they wanted nothing to do with me. So again, ripping the streets of uh, Richmond now. Um, I got a, a Facebook message from a girl that I went to high school with, and she always had a crush on me. <laughs> but anyway, she kind of saw that things were wrong because I would post stuff that was just. And her heart was for the Lord. She loved Jesus. So she asked me if I wanted to come out and get help. She said she would give me a roof over my head. Um, but what I had to do, there were three stipulations, and she was very, very, very adamant. She said, you will work, you will stay clean, and you will go to recovery meetings. Her previous husband had been an alcoholic, and they got divorced because of it. So anyway, she knew about it. So that's when uh, I moved to Winchester. I, oh, I'll never forget. Oh, by the way, I beat up old car. It was a 1994 Thunderbird. Excellent. Classic. Excellent. Blue, blue paint. Three shades of paint. I think some of it was house paint. <laughs> I don't know how. But I pulled in Winchester, man. It's, first of all, you heard it. Yeah. Second of all, you, you the smoke. I'm sure you smelled it, too. So I pulled in Winchester. I did a last run of like 60 Xanax bars. I was loaded. And I ran over a curb. Uh, at a, off of Jubal early and flattened both my tires. And so she came and got me. And um, I had no money, so she had to get me two car tires. Um, and then, uh, like I said, those were the stipulations. I got a job working as a, uh, a call uh, center guy. Um, and um, Was it a National Wildlife? No, it was a place called Invenio. Okay. Uh, it's it's the only place that would hire felons. I got you. It's the only job I can get. I understand. But it paid the bills. And yeah. I, and and I, I attended meetings. That's when I first started attending recovery meetings. Okay. Um, I joined. Uh, and that's like 2008. No, no, we we're no, no, no. We're 2011. Oh wow. Okay. So I told you, there's a lot of time. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm I'm yeah. I'm feeling the timeline. I because you said Facebook, so that's post. 2007. Yeah, yeah, 2011. Yeah, okay. March 2, 2011. Okay. And so anyway, uh, I did what I was told. Got clean. We we. Uh, I I think she her intentions. I hope she doesn't watch this. I don't <laughs> think her intentions were for me to be a boyfriend. I think she genuinely wanted to help me out. Yeah. No, I don't think she wanted me to do this. Man. I understand. Uh, I was terrible, man. I weighed a ton of weight. I sweated profusely. It was awful. Finding a job in the summer, I had a three-piece suit. I'll never forget it. I did get a job, though, um, and I did well um, there. Uh, went to meetings every day, every day. Um, met people in recovery. Yeah. Um, and just flourished. Yeah. You know, uh, about a year and a half in, um, I, 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 I uh, there's a, a, a guy that, that has a, owns a business here locally, Mike Barrett, Barrett Machines. Asked me if I wanted to start a little Bible study in his in his break room, 
and uh, he had a, some people and he heard about me and so we, I said yes so we did a little Bible study maybe four of us um, and that grew like crazy um, we, 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 we couldn't fit in the break room anymore and about that time Mike Woods from uh, Grace Community Church um, had heard about me and uh, and one day asked me to lunch and asked me if I'd be interested in coming on staff and being the uh, liaison between the recovery community and the church. So it sounds like, you know, a lot of the stuff that you touch, it goes really well. Yes. At the same time, it can go extremely bad. Correct. So, you know, the stuff that goes really well, like, and I know that, you know, don't give me a youth group answer and just say Jesus, all right? <laughs> but like, what do you attest to that? Like, you know, you, you know, Bible study at a, at a business and it grows, and it grows from people, you know, you know, a small house church in Virginia beach blows up to 1500 people. Like, what do you attribute that? To? So, uh, I, 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 and I, I'll, yeah, I won't give you the Jesus thing. It's cool. I think there's some, uh, there's some, um, Legitimate. merit. Okay. And the gifts that Jesus gives. Amen. I think my gift okay. uh, is, and, and Bobby will tell you, your pastor will tell you that it's the, I have the gift of attraction. Okay. Um, people just like me. Yeah. And uh, my teaching is very simple. Um, it, I, I, I scream, I, I shout. Um, I te- you know, I, every message I give is personal. Okay. Which, it's like it's like a reachable thing like people can right. touch out and like absolutely and like actually grab a hold of it well and through the years i've become very transparent yeah i mean uh, and i'll we'll touch on this today i mean today. you've I been mean, extremely transparent the whole time i've known oh no well and i think that's what it is you know there's no fake yeah there's no church face yeah i have some people that sometimes tell me brad took off the church face <laughs> one person in particular you know owes me accountable to that because i can't i, I could be like on stage, yeah, and that's not good. So, um, anyway, um, I started as an assistant pastor for him, uh, and uh, that's when um, uh, the couple that owned the bar downtown, Brew Bakers, asked if we'd be interested in, in starting something in their in their uh, back room. Mm-hmm. So we did start a church in a bar with I about with about twenty five thirty people who came over from that church, and mm-hmm. that blew up. Yeah, that blew up. Man. Yeah. And so we were like three services. It was crazy. Well, you had a good, you know, you still have a good reputation, but like that. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. But I know that, um, you know, there's truth, <clears throat> there's lies. Yes. And I'm thinking of the truth part. I, and I'll be very, tr- you don't have to make up anything. Yeah. No, it's I'm bad not, enough. Oh, no, I'm not making you know, up anything. No, I'm just saying you. But, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, it's out there. And, and look, we're doing this. <laughs> The whole message of my life is, you know, never give up, yeah. never give up. God's yeah. never done with you. Constant redemption. Absolutely. And, you know, if you're willing and, uh, and uh, you're, you're, you're uh, vulnerable and, and God can do anything through you, I don't mm-hmm. care where you've been. Yeah. Uh, I just don't care. Yeah. People tell me, you're, stop, stop. Don't, you don't need to open another church. No, don't do it. But I mean, you, that's not what I heard from God. Because yeah, I'll never stop. If I've met, I mean, I haven't met that many people in my life. You've met way more than I have. But if I've met somebody that's supposed to be in the body of Christ, that's supposed to be in the church, you know, it's definitely you. Oh, you, amen. You have that gifting with people. It, well, and people are faithful. Even yeah. though I let them down. Yeah. Well, anyway, let me finish that story because it's important. We started church and bar grew. We moved to another facility, grew, and then COVID hit. Yeah. And right when, okay, so how, how transparent do you want me to be? It's up to you, man. You can be as little as more. I mean, I know the story, you know, but you don't, you know. Okay, so before COVID hit, a little bit before COVID hit, okay, we had an issue in our church. Yeah. We were I, growing quickly. Okay. And we had, I'm going to be transparent. You can be transparent okay. as you want. You can use whatever language you want. So don't judge me. Just try not to use any foul language. No, I will never. Do. I mean, it's, it's cool if you do, just because YouTube will tag us. Uh, no, no, no. Foul language. Um, but you can use, you know, you can talk about homosexuality. You can talk okay. about, you know, anything. We're good. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So anyway, right before COVID hit, we you know, we we grew. We, I think we we're at two services, and 
Uh, we had an issue. Um, I'm sorry. I'm trying to say it right now. We can talk about LGBTQ. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we had an LBG whatever yeah. um, issue in our church. We had two women that were serving um, in the kids' ministry that uh, were uh, married. Yeah. Um, and I, I, knew, I guess I, I can't blame anybody. I guess I knew about it, but I, I didn't think about it. Um, and then we also had uh, two uh, folks that were living together um, that weren't married. Okay. Teaching the kids as well. So uh, this is right before COVID hit. So um, simultaneously, you had these two things going on. Correct. Okay. And we were going to clean house. Well, both of the things. Correct. Not just on the LGBTQ. Absolutely. Because what I'm hearing right now is that you're being consistent. Absolutely. You're not just being pushing on one nope. thing. You're being consistent across the whole board. That's what it's all about. Okay, right on. Unfortunately, and you'll see the the the, the LBGQT thing probably was the focus. worse. Oh yeah, yeah. but became any, the focus. Yeah, well, so um, we, you know, the board, Brad, what are you going to do? You know, uh, and of course, I'm like, well, I'm not going to do anything. But that I just it didn't sit well. So um, I called them both in, both couples, uh, with some uh, backup, and uh, neither one of them received it well at all. Especially the uh, the women. Yeah. Um, they were upset. They called uh, the Winchester Star, the local paper here, mm -hmm. and then they also went on Facebook. I'll never forget and it. Just and berated you. Oh, my gosh. You have no idea. Yeah, from a distance, I watched it. It was bad. It was. It were. You have no idea. Yeah. It got so bad. I just I quit Facebook. Um, I was getting message of hate, uh, death. Um, There's no easy way to walk through that. What you what you did. There's no easy way to do it. Yeah. Like it can go sideways at any time. Right. And so you know it was going to be, you know, for lack of a better term, a dumpster fire. You right. know, almost regardless. Well, we were hoping that we could just deal with those Minimize the damage, Correct. sort of, yeah. yeah. Well, the Bible says if you have ought to get your brother, go to that brother. Right? Absolutely. So, so we did. It was obvious that they were not, Yeah. they weren't having it. Yeah, because their, their theology allows them to Correct. stay with what they're doing. So they, like I said, put it on Facebook. I called the Winchester Star. At this point, we're in damage control. Yes. I had to get up Yeah. and say something. So that Sunday, the church was slammed. Mm. People standing, like standing. In support or well, to watch you fall? 50-50. Okay. And they just want to hear it. Yeah. And I think I gave, you know, again, I've gone back and, and listened to that message. I think I gave the best message I could at the time. Yeah. Um, but that's when the way, uh, I'll never forget it, Nick. So at the end of the service, they say amen. I wish I could mention names. This idiot <laughs> from the Winchester, I can't stand him. He's still in a reporter. Came up to me and said, do you have any comments? I said, about what? Does he have any additional comments in, on what you just said? And I said, first of all, get out of my church. How dare you come in this place and disrespect? At least come in to tell me that you're here. Yeah. Uh, get out of here. And I walked him out. I mean, forced. I mean, that's probably the best thing you could have done. Oh, uh, yeah, man. But he wrote a horrible article. Oh, day. yeah, it was terrible. And, I, and uh, it was completely biased. Oh, absolutely. And, and two, you know, it's funny. Um, that same morning, that next morning, we lived on a street um, that we lived on the dead end of the street. To get out, you had to go buy a house. And somebody put, somebody actually bought huge homeless uh, rainbow flags and gave them to each each of our neighbors and asked them if they could put it up and apparently every one but, but like two or three so when you drove out of our we just littered with it next day yeah, man, that's rough dude. and everywhere I went it didn't matter I mean how long did that last six months well no well here we go oh because when COVID hit oh yeah yeah, yeah. right um, I started I, I needed a release. Oh. I was just, and it wasn't a church getting hammered. It was me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. It was all on you. Yeah. 
So, I mean, I have had, I mean, I, Nick, I was like, I, get, I, just, I can't do this. Yeah. Mentally. I'm a people person. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I thrive off that and it was gone. Yeah. And so I, I ended up doing uh, Kratom. Doing what? Kratom. Kratom. You all know what it is. I'm about I to, cannot believe you don't know this. I'm about to Google Your that kids thing. are doing it. No, they're not. Not your kids. Yeah. Maybe. Some of your kids are doing it. Kratom? Mm hmm. Let's let them look it up. How do you spell that? K R A T O M. K R A T U M. That's probably it. It's a T? Kratom. You're not getting it? No. K R A T O M. Mm -hmm. It's a T. The Kratom. Yeah, it's a, it's a, but is it a T? Oh, no, it's a drug. Well, yeah, but you can do drugs as tea. Tea, though. yeah, pills. Okay. Nick, you need to look around when you're driving. Every one of the smoke shops is carrying it. You see it on the science of Kratom. Really? It's a, it's a legal drug. Okay. Which I think Congress is now working on. Um, it mimics, it mimics opioid. Really? Yes. How did I not know about this? This is big. Wow. I guess the things that I still I still pay attention to drug culture uh -huh. stuff because I'm still fascinated uh -huh. by it. Even the '80s with you know the cocaine epidemic in the in the South Florida, right? You know, it's like that. I'm just fascinated by that for some reason. I don't know if it's my fallen human condition. Not we all. I mean, <laughs> you know, but um, it's part of our ministry too. Yeah, the psychedelics it's though is the thing that that I've you know be more like inclined to learn more about than uh, some of the well, other Well, this can things. be a psychedelic. Yeah, that's what I'm looking into. So this is now very popular. Yeah. Um, this and K2. Heard of K2? Yeah, I've heard of K2. Okay, this is very this is similar. Okay. But it mimics... Op so anyway, all the smoke shops sell them, and they're on the sign. And it's legal. And it's legal for now. Oh, my God. And, but see, that's why they're building these... Have you noticed a lot of smoke shops? Yeah, well, built? that's because they're gearing up because starting in July... Pot's going to be legal right. in Virginia, but the but the kratom is it right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I guarantee some of your kids are doing it. It's all over. Well, there was like stevia or salvia a couple of years ago. Well, stevia, no. no, not stevia. No, there was a there was like a it was like similar to like K two or something where it was like a synthetic pot that they were selling um, in the smoke shops. That was, was really that bad, dude. Uh, but this I, is really bad. Yeah. So I took kratom. You get high. Yeah. I mean, you got high. Okay. And so I was doing this. Without anybody really knowing about it, yeah. Uh, my wife didn't know about it. Um, I did that until that was that kind of <coughs> lost the interest in it, and so I went to a psycho psychologist. Pleaded anxiety. Um, he knew who I was. Yeah, and he said you just you need some help. It meant uh, the, so he gave me some Xanax. He gave me a lot of Xanax and a lot of Klonopin. Mm. I was doing that with Graydon while pastoring Phil. Yeah. People ask me, are you okay? No, I'm just tired. Yeah. I'm frustrated. You know, I, did, I did this for a while until it became obvious and people started approaching me saying, you got a problem. I ignored him. Um, one night, the board got together with my wife and gave me an ultimatum, get help or you're fired and you're not going home. So I went to a rehab and uh, got help. And here I am today. Man, that's some vulnerable story, man. I really appreciate you sharing that on oh, that I level, man. That's a lot. Dude. Yeah. So is there like, um, you know, throughout your life, you've had all these different, almost all these different lives, you know, from... You're absolutely right. From, from uh, you know, Utah and New Jersey to Southern California, you live multiple lives. Is there something that, um, you know, that stands out that like was a was a... What was one of, I guess, like your biggest influences positively, you know, that uh, you can, that stands out maybe that, you know, you could always kind of fall back to? I mean, I know God was kind of always there, but is there somebody that was, you know, um, a positive influence, maybe Chuck Smith or? You know, he's, he, uh, no, because when all that happened to me, I was, I was let go of the Calvary Chapel. Yeah. So it's not just one, it's all. Yeah. Um, no, um, nobody. I mean, 
Yeah. This journey has been long. Yeah. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I have this, I know Jesus is coming back. I have no doubt. Yeah. And I want to do everything I can. Uh, if I still have that capability to get people saved. Are you still close with your like biological family at all? Oh yeah. So it's been in and out with my brothers, but yes. We text every day. Did together. they did the one who introduced you to drugs, did he ever like live that life too, or was it just a I don't know. I you know, it's funny, Facebook is awesome. Yes, it is. You, you spy on people. You can learn a lot. Yeah, and so he he didn't do well okay. in life. Um a lot of my fraternity brothers didn't really do well in life. Yeah. Um, I, I, Nick, I, I got to say, I am, I am grateful to God for never giving up on me. Yeah. And uh, I, there's no, I wish I could do it all over again. But then, I, on the other hand, I, I know this is God. Yeah. Using for good. Absolutely, what the devil meant for you, mm -hmm. and so I'm. I'm just. I'm, I have to compensate. I'm six years old. I'm yeah. done. I'm yeah. done. I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Um, I, I. My dad died at seventy one. My mother at seventy three. So I think. Let's hope not. Let's hope yeah. you got some. But I mean, ther seriously, I want to live a good life. Yeah. You know, and uh, there are struggles today. I mean, to be totally transparent, um, my marriage through all that. Um, my using, my deception, all that is, we're struggling. We're, we're, we're working together to make it right. Yeah. That's a struggle for us. Um, every day I meet someone that, uh, that I have to make amends to. That's the neat thing about working a program recovery is you have step four, which has made a searching and fearless moral inventory. Um, and I did that I mean, all the way back. Yeah, and I've been able to make amends. I I, I talked. Did I talk about the abortion? You kind of like touched on it, but we didn't really dig into it. Yeah. Then. So back in college, I had a girlfriend. They asked to get an abortion twice, and then multiple ones after that. And I actually paid for it, uh, and it never bothered me until I got saved. Um, but I tried to make amends to those to those folks. The one girlfriend I had, um, I wrote back and I just said, "Can I, you know, share with you how sorry I am?" And she wrote back, and she berated me. It was the best decision we've ever made. Mm. And just went off. How dare you? How dare you do that? You know, oh, how apologize dare, yeah, for it. You don't need. Don't you know? You don't need to bring that up. No, and I just let it go. Yeah. But I've had, you know, again, I, I Nick, my my list of amends. It's funny. My sponsor says, you you know, this will take the rest of your life to, yeah, to do. And there's some people I just can't. Yeah. My my parents are dead. Um, some people are dead. Chuck Smith, I, I owe a big one to. He's dead. But uh, there's people that I can make amends to, and I'm doing it. Yeah. And uh, I'm one of the things I'm very grateful is this time around, um, things are different Yeah. for me. Have you ever thought about writing a book? Um, so, and not just to tell your story. Yeah. That can be, you know, peppered with your story. Correct. But have you ever thought about well, writing a there's, book? Well, it's funny. People always invite me to write a book yeah. with them. I would encourage and you I've too. Been, I've been looking, wait for the right person, and I think the right person has come along. Okay. Um, the yeah. Obershane family is real big in Virginia, but um, Kate Obershane. Because your story is extremely powerful. I mean, it's very similar to you know writers that I've read before too. You know, like Brendan Manning. I don't know if you've heard of him before. He was a, yeah, oh, absolutely a, a, a defrocked Catholic monk, right, a priest right, right. who. You know his his book Ragamuffin Gospel is I've a, heard a hugely yeah, yeah. popular book, but his book Abba's Child deeply changed my life. Wow! And um, he has his story of recovery, hiding his alcoholism from his church and his family and wow. stuff. And you know it's a really powerful testimony. You know, but your story is you know because it's the gospel the whole way. Absolutely, every bit of it's the gospel. Absolutely. I mean, I mean it's your life that's been lived out and you know, from successes to failures that, right. you know, God has certainly, you know, revealed himself along the entire way, but you've lived a life of redemption. I'm the most blessed person on earth. Yeah. And uh, I, I tell you, Nick, you have a story too, so um, 
we won't talk about that right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, this podcast is to hear other. Well, and stories. and here's the deal with this podcast. So I selfishly can learn. From well, them. and all you, all your followers, um, you know, you've made that. There are certain people that have that hadn't necessarily lived the life that I lived, or yeah. that of an addict, or uh, and I'll call it. Uh, certain people that can actually uh, minister. Yeah. People like me. But there are far of you between. Yeah, it's not many. You're one of them. Yeah, it's not many. Man. It, you're one of them. I mean, no, I, I literally. That. And uh, so back at the uh, other church that I had before I fell, um, you know, we had other other people that tried real hard. They just didn't. Just, you know, it's impossible. God did this so that He could get the glory yeah. from from people that are saved. Absolutely. That's it. Yeah. That's why I look at it. This Absolutely. life. It was hard. I'm tired. Yeah. I really am. I'm tired. So if you could, because we're going to you know, kind of close yep. it out here a little bit. So if there's something that, you know, I, I, I'd like you to give a closing thought, but I'd like you to also maybe, you know, let, let's see if I can get this question out right. Okay. And that's like, you know, so like you've been through a lot, man. I mean, you've been in the pressure cooker. You've been sitting on the beach, you know. And so, you know, is there something that for the next, you know, 10, 15 years maybe that you maybe like, I know it's hard for you to have a vision for that far in the future, maybe, but you know, you're in your sixties now. You're not, you know, a twenty year old kid. You're not even a forty year old kid anymore. You're an experienced veteran that, you know, is, you know, keeps being called up from the minors to play in the big leagues. Amen. Man. And so is there something over the next like ten, fifteen years maybe that is a big enough dream that maybe you can't do that you'd like to do? Right. So here's the deal, uh, and I, I'm very adamant about this. You can't this politics stuff yeah, dude. and people siding and doing you know and, and placing all their effort into this national scene. Yeah, it's malarkey. You can we can I can it just bugs me. Yeah, we all we all we have is our community. Yeah, that's so. Instead of focusing in on everything that's. You can't change. Yeah. You can't change. You can't change it. Mm -mm. You can change what's next to you. Yeah. My goal, my heart. Winchester, I don't know if you know this, and you this might be news to you, but it's referred to as the capital of, of recovery. Yes, because there's more per capita recovery places in Winchester than the entire state. Correct. We have multiple rehabs. Yep. We have multiple Oxford houses. Yep. I think the last count was... Oxford houses were like 17. Wow. And then we have yeah. other houses. Are those like halfway houses? Yes. Sort of? uh -huh. Okay. Um, I mean, everybody comes here, gets clean, saves. Yes. So, I mean, <coughs> gosh, I mean, if God was going to give me a field. It's given it to you. He's given it to me. Yeah. So, here's the deal. I have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Uh, redemption. I am redeemed with God, but I need that. There's a lot of redemption that still needs to, needs to take place for me to be as effective as I think I can be. I got you. The neat thing about this place is it's transient. Yes. People come, stick around for a while, and leave. Yeah. I think most of the people, you know, that had a problem with the WGQT no. yeah. and or, uh, all I, that. I have moved on. Kind of moved on yeah. or have forgotten. Yeah. I'm not noticed as much for that in stores. Yeah. The other day I was. but Yeah. I mean, it's still here, though. So it is. We, we did a really good Zoom call, and I'm going to send you the link to the uh -huh. video because it was really good about ministering with you know young people that are de that are right. I don't want to say dealing with it because that's going to marginalize them if they might have a problem. You know, we want to listen to people, we want to hear their heart, we want right. to be able to walk alongside of them. Yeah. But at the same time, we want to be biblical in our approach to things. And you know, there's a really bad plague upon the church over the last 20 years of you know, progressivism, and I don't care if I'm going to say that, you know, but that's influenced the church in a very negative way. Correct. To where we've allowed our human morals to stand in place of God's values. Come on. And so, um, you know, it was a really good conversation with some, like, really strong leaders. That, wow, please. You know, that really give you, you know, that are encouraging about even, like, just shifting some of your language, you know, to where you're not affirming somebody, but, you know, not using the word like homosexual or using, you know, ga uh, or gay agenda or things like that. You know, you don't want to say things as going to like, 
you know, trigger somebody to like, you know, not want the gospel. You know, you want to be able to encourage Correct. them, you know, to come closer. And it's the same thing with the recovery community Correct. as well. You know, you want to be able to use language that they hear, that they feel loved, that they feel appreciated, that they don't feel marginalized, that they want to just be a part of a community and be loved just like you and I want to right. be loved. I want to be loved as much as them. Oh my gosh. And and <laughs> when you come into our church, and I, I I I say this. It's never happened to me before, and I pastor a long time. This church, you know, they say family, family, family. Well, this is actually the family. Yeah. I mean, I'm amazed. I mean, I can tell from the times I've been there twice. Yeah, just the amount of family that it's amazed. They it, love you, and they love each other. And they do, and they love Crossroads. Yeah, dude, the and I, they love you. The, I mean, I, the island of misfit <laughs> Fit toys, yeah, misfit toys. Yeah, let me tell you, Nick came and taught, and one of the people said, "Hey, can Nick be our pastor?" <laughs> so anyway, and you just got ordained. Shout out! Yeah, that was awesome. You got ordained, man. I really appreciate. Did you tell you your people there. that, yeah. I have not. Oh, did I ruin the surprise? No, you're good. I'm not. He a, just got ordained, I'm, man. I'm not a big person when it comes to that kind of stuff. Talking, I don't do a good job talking about myself. You know, not saying you do or anything. I'm I just, probably do. I too don't. Much. I, I don't do a good job of that. But that was a really meaningful night. Cause, you know, my family was there. That was awesome. My mom and my dad's, and awesome. you know, my sister, my little brother and his wife weren't there. My older brother and his family weren't there, and I was a little bummed that not everybody could be there. But it was deeply meaningful. And you know, that was, you know, that was the first time that that happened like that here. That was the first time. For I think the last ordination that Crossroads did was in 2007. Wow. And so this was the first one that how, how was like this. How did Chris ordained? Chris already was ordained okay. when he came here, and so it was just transferred. Okay. So it wasn't anything special. He just got a certificate, a cert, you know. And but this one was like, you know, a son of the house. You know, we've been here for almost nine years, and we came here to be the youth pastors, youth leaders, and by vocationally did it for you know, it, you know, seven of the nine years that we've been here. You know, there's a lot to say about that, and I, I, I hope the people that are watching. Can we talk a little bit more? Sure, man. I, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm this good. This is important. Yeah, go for it. You spent nine years plowing the field. Seven years. Seven, still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven years plowing the field, expecting nothing. No. You just did what God called you to do, yeah. and we you had, did it well. Yeah. We actually had a goal we set when we first came here that the younger kids that were in youth group, we weren't allowed to leave until they graduated high school. Wow. We set that goal. And then they all graduated, and we were like, so what are we going to do? <laughs> but it, but there's a story here, um, and it's different from mine. You actually came here and you did that without any expectation. Yeah, no. And you worked in Plow the Field, you and your wife. Yeah. And it's just to me that's that's the way ministry works. Yeah. And actually, somebody was recruiting me in 2019. Really? To go move to um, help at their church in, in, in Florida. And we were seriously considering it. She has a big ministry. She's a really sweet lady. I met her. I picked her and her assistant up from the airport a couple of times when they were ministering locally. Got to minister with them, spend some, spend some time with them. And I think that lit a fire under Bobby. <laughs> Did you know about it? Oh, yeah. I was very, very transparent. I'm very transparent. He went up and said, I'm thinking about, I'm praying well, no, about it. I, I said, hey, I need you to pray about something. Because he's a spiritual father as much as he is my pastor. Yeah. We both wear a lot of hats with each other. Right. And I was like, I need you to put on the spiritual father hat here. And somebody, I'm going to meet with this person and potentially move to Florida. And he was like, okay. And this wasn't the first time. People have recruited me in the past to go move to a different place of the country. But nobody, it's never fleshed out. So we keep thinking like God's just like, nope, you're not done here yet. You know, you still have a lot to do. And so that it during the process, we learned that we probably shouldn't move to Florida because I've never <coughs> been a senior leader of a church before. And so I probably, I mean, could I do it? Sure. You know, I'll jump in and learn and figure it out. But, you know, I feel like I needed to get my feet wet, I think, in ministry a little bit more before I just like jumped into something with that, with that amount of responsibility and, and, and authority. But then at the same time, I think lit a fire under Bobby, like, okay, we need to do something because we could lose him. And, you know, and I'm not a self-talker, but like, you know, I don't, as long as I'm in Winchester, I'm never going to be a part of another church. This is my home, you know, and we're very like stable people here. You know, like we shored up the youth ministry by, by being here. You know, when a ton of youth leaders over the time that Crossroads was here, you know, in the 20 plus years, they've been youth past that this has been a church 
I want to say there's been like eight youth pastors. Wow. And we've been there for almost nine years. Wow. So, I mean, do the math on the first half on that. Right. You know, and so like, and it's not a knock on Crossroads, it's not a knock on those leaders, it's just calling it for what it is. You know, we shored up this area that was that needed strong leadership. And, you know. Well, it just goes to show, and I think a lot of people, I don't know, but I always, the ministry should never be glamorized. Never, dude. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not what people think it is. No. People think I work on Sunday for two hours. No. Um, but the story, your story is completely different from mine. Being faithful in the little things. Yeah. And God will give you the greater. To me, I, that's why when I was sitting there watching get that ordination, I'm like, this guy's been here. This whole this time has never asked. No. I never brought that up. Well, I asked Bob if he did. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, and not once. Nope. And uh, I, I just, it, the humility of working and plowing and not expecting anything. I think a lot of, man, you, uh, it's funny. People wanted to come in the ministry and become leaders. Yeah. Be, you know, be careful what you ask for. Yes. And realize this, that it's hard work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, sometimes it takes time. It does. I mean, I learned a lot of that from, you know, growing up in kitchens. I was a chef for a long time, That's right, you, are. you know, before we bought our restaurant, and that was a huge failure. <laughs> but, um, you know, you, you, you better think clear quickly before you, or think long and hard before you ask for another level of, of responsibility, because you might not be ready for it. You know, like, I worked at this one restaurant for, off and on, for almost four years. I left it a couple of times. How old are you? Part -time. I'm 41. Wow. And so in early 2000s, I was working in this restaurant. And it was, that's where I say I cut my teeth working in fine dining because I learned a lot during that time. I did not work with, I did not work with what you would call like educated people because, you know, these were career cooks that, you know, worked at the same restaurant for 20 years. And, you know, right. same grinding job, hot summers, cold winters, you know. And I learned so much in that time, but. I worked at the grill where you cook like steaks and different things like that, looking at the other station where like you had to have skills to work the saute station in this restaurant because I mean, half the menu was you cooking with nine pans at once, being able to manage you wow. know, finishing sauces, getting pastas going, searing duck breasts or things like that. You know, like you had to be able to manage a lot in that time frame. And I'm like 21 looking at that like I want to do this job, but I knew to like watch, learn, ask questions from Cecil, who was a huge influence on me, who was the sous chef for, you know, ever at this place. And I learned to just watch and learn. And then when I knew I felt like I could, you know, fail okay, then I would ask for it. But then, you know, it took a long time to get there. And it's the same kind of concept that I've just always adopted throughout my whole life. Mm -hmm. is I'm going to watch. I'm going to learn. I'm right. going to pay attention. I'm a very astute observer. Right. I'm going to see things. Like we even teach our youth kids when we're on trips, what mile marker are we at on the highway? Because I want them to be aware yeah. of their surroundings. If an emergency happens, you have to call 911. You want to be right. able to tell them what mile marker I never thought at. about that. You know? there, Charlie. And, and so like there's things like that that like I've you know really like put in the forefront of my mind you know, to be able to like do. And so, you know, I just translate that into ministry as well. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to walk slowly. I'm not going to try to take off. So moving to Florida might have been biting off a little more than I can chew. But, you know, I... I well, I, I'll say this. Uh, you know, I've worked with you a little bit here and there. I, there's no doubt you're calling strong. I mean, when I was sitting up there with you guys, um, I thank you. That was a privilege and an honor. That was... I, I, I was me, really happy that you could be there. For me, to, well... Bobby had asked, and I'm just like, it was just, my heart just swelled, and just the amount of commitment and work. I, I appreciate things like that. Yeah. Um, I appreciate things like, you know, yeah. people that really have been there doing the hard work. Um, so, uh, congratulations, Thanks, though. Man. So proud of you, and appreciate doing this. Yeah, write a book, maybe one day. Um, do it, I'm, man. But I'm, I, I do want to end with this. Don't, don't try to change something you can't change. Yeah, that's good. Stay local, man. They have this thing, stay local, buy local. Yeah. The only people you can change are here. Yeah. Forget about yeah. posting on Facebook or Sean Hannity or Bill O'Reilly or <laughs> whoever stop else. Stop that nonsense. Yeah. You can't, there's nothing you can do. Spend 
Spend time in your community. That's relationship. Absolutely. That's I relationship. can only change Winchester. Like, exactly. Unless God calls me somewhere else, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm not, I'm not focused on this other crap because that's Sam Ballot and Tobiah. You know, you know them? No. Nehemiah's building the wall, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Doing yeah, a yeah. great job. Sam Ballot and Tobiah say, come over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I come remember. Come on, man. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Man, there's so many Sam Ballot and Tobiahs in my life. Oh, yeah. you can't pastor. You're done. Yeah. Man, what are you kidding me? Look at your reputation. Stop it. You know, yeah. that's Sam Ballot and Tobias to me. That's and, a good point. And Nehemiah just kept building. Yeah. And was it was it Nehemiah or somebody else helped me build where they had swords in one hand that's it. and they were building that with was the it. other? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Building that's, and protecting. Absolutely. Building and protecting. Absolutely. And those two were there. I mean, they keep showing up. Yeah. And eventually he stopped. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to do. Sam Bell will die. They'll be, it'll be quiet soon. Yeah. Amen. It'll be quiet soon. Right on, man. Yeah. Great, great, great word. Love you guys. I love this. Well, you've watched this long. You might as well like and subscribe. <laughs> so thanks for tuning in. Brad, thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you. you. Love you. Amen. Bye.